We've talked about movie ratings and their broken system, but what about a system that rates video games? Are they just as broken rating games with an outdated rubric that isn't what gamers need or want? Or do they genuinely protect consumers? Honestly, the answer today might surprise you because I know it surprised me considering how infrequently I see companies that actually care. So hello and welcome back to The Corporate Casket. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today we're going to be talking about the ESRB system. Or if you've got no idea what that is, it's the system that rates video games. Just as an FYI, it stands for Entertainment Software Rating Board. Ever since I talked about the MPAA a couple months back, many of you requested this topic. And I was honestly curious to check it out, but I kind of also forgot for a couple months, so that was my bad. Now, typically we start with a company or organization's history, but today we're actually going to start from the situation that led to there being a need for the ESRB in the first place. Also, as a brief warning, there will be some mentions of violence and sexual abuse in today's episode. It won't be gory, but it will be present. So that's your heads up. Now, controversial video games are absolutely nothing new. Let me be super clear about one of the biggest debates going around video games. There is not sufficient evidence to link video games to violent acts. The APA or American Psychological Association themselves even say that. And I mean, hey, maybe some violent people enjoy violent games, but to suggest that games are the cause of that, they exacerbate violent tendencies or that gamers themselves are violent people, it's an irresponsible statement. But that could literally be its own episode in of itself. With that said, I do think that video games need a review so that kids aren't being shown adult content. And this is where the rating system comes into play. According to one source, Death Race, released in 1976, was known as the father of controversial video games, despite it being tame compared to more recent standards. Death Race was based on the movie Death Race 2000, and the purpose of the game was to run over as many gremlins as possible within a given amount of time. After each successful squash, an X would take the place of a gremlin on the screen. And this apparently was a very evil thing. GameSpot says that the game was so aggressively rejected by the public that shortly after its release, Exidy, the publisher, pulled the game off store shelves. Completely removing a game from retail doesn't happen too often, but when it does, it often has to do with how far the realistic graphics go in depicting one form of violence or another. However, the reason Death Race was so publicly lambasted had nothing to do with the graphics, which were simply black and white characters plotted on the screen. It actually had to do with the sound effects, one in particular. Stephen Kent, author of The Ultimate History of Video Games says, what got everyone upset about Death Race was that you heard this little ack when a person got hit and a little gravestone came up. The controversy even made 60 minutes. Nowadays, this sounds absolutely silly that something so small as this would have a game actually removed from the shelves. However, though this may be the father of controversial video games, there were ones that came later that are far worse. Custer's Revenge, released in 1983, was also denounced. Apparently, the player's avatar, General Custer himself, needed to rape and plunder as many Native American women as possible in the gameplay, and I'm not kidding about that. The player would dash across the stream away from enemy arrows to reach a Native American woman tied helplessly to a pole. Custer would then have his way with her for points that contributed to the player's high score, then proceeded to the next stage. This game even showed Custer's genitals when he did this. The developer said the act was mutually consenting, but it doesn't really explain why the women were tied to a fucking pole. Hell, 80s video games, what were you doing? Much to my own regret, I actually decided to see if this game was truly as bad as it sounded, and yeah, it kind of is. Like the little Custer character is naked with his very erect pixelated self open in like the entire game. So I'll admit that getting upset over the game Death Race seems a little silly, but wanting a rating system so that kids aren't picking up games like Custer's Revenge also seems kind of reasonable. At least the ESRB seems to have been born of good intentions. But there's a couple more controversial video games that according to Shaq News helped push the need for a rating system. One of them was called Night Trap and it was released in 1992. Shaq News explains. This game is actually one of the most misunderstood of our controversial bunch. The FMW based game asked the player to protect nightgown clad co-eds spending the night together in a large house allegedly haunted by vampires. Pillow fights, braiding hair, giggling over guys, seemingly innocent, right? Well, actually it was. Once again, I turn to author Stephen Kent to give you the 411. 
To this day, the people who are attacking Night Trap really don't, to me, seem like they've played the game. They still talk about this game where you were killing co-eds, but you're not, you're saving co-eds. Mr. Kent, you are absolutely right. The reason this game was targeted was due to a cutscene that played it the player failed to protect a co-ed. They would die, as one would expect from any ill-tempered vampire. But parents and officials claimed that excessive violence and rape were depicted. Ladies and gentlemen, it just ain't so. Even after the confusion surrounding Night Trap began to dissipate, several political figures weren't able to let bygones be bygones. And one of the most influential of these figures was Australian Labor Senator Margaret Reynolds. In May of 1993, Senator Reynolds began campaigning for a type of rating system to control the release of games in Australia, such as Night Trap, which was the main example she used to advocate the need of such a system. By October of the same year, the report on video and computer games and classification issues was released, but most industry experts saw it as nothing more than a compilation of rampant conjecture. You might say that Night Trap and Senator Reynolds were both responsible for getting the gears moving in terms of people to consider a rating system for video games. Again, I'm not disputing the existence of a rating system at all. I mean, seeing Custer's Revenge was, that was enough for me. And now with today's technology and more advanced graphics, well, imagining what Custer's Revenge might look like in 2020 would just be nightmare fuel for me. And I'm very much not interested in seeing that any more pixelated than what I already saw. However, I will say that I do think Senator Reynolds was off the mark by using Night Trap as an example. Come on, you guys, you gotta help me. If you're going to have that as the backbone for a rating system, at least these political figures could have done a little fact check. However, all too soon, the frustration around Night Trap was replaced by the outrage of the 1992 Mortal Kombat games. This game basically takes the credit for the ESRB being created at all. I checked out a video of the 1992 game being played and honestly, I wouldn't really see the little ketchup looking splashes be considered super graphic, but I guess I'm spoiled with more realistic video games now too. Scorpion win fatality. And for the record, when I'm saying I'm spoiled, um, I'm playing the remastered version of Pikmin 3 and that's all I play. But anyway, th- seriously though, there's been gigantic improvements from pixel graphics of the 80s and the Mortal Kombat in the 90s. So as video games grew more and more popular, a ranking system became more needed. As a result, ESRB was founded in 1994. So let's jump into who ESRB is and talk about their early days, the system and their growth. According to one source, the Entertainment Software Rating Board is a voluntary group that rates the content of video games, including console, Xbox, PlayStation, etc., games and personal computer games. The Entertainment Software Association, ESA, the leading trade association of the video game industry, created the ESRB in 1994. The ESRB does not rate the quality of games, but tries to objectively describe their content and identify anything that is potentially offensive. Three game raters are needed for each game and these game raters can't be just anyone. They need training and just like with the MPAA, their identities are hidden to preserve the integrity of the process. Raters can't have any connection to the game industry either, presumably because they'd be biased if they did. When a publisher plans to release a game, they submit an application to the ESRB. Then they send a video of footage from the actual game, including the most extreme examples of potentially offensive content and overall gameplay. The raiders view this footage, they never actually play the game and assigned it to an ESRB rating, for example, E for everyone. Once all the raiders agree, the rating is official. If they don't, then more raiders are brought in to try and reach some sort of consensus. Packaging is another part of the preview process too, and that must also meet a certain set of ESRB standards. At a first glance, I was actually surprised to hear that only three reviewers are required. Personally, I think the minimum would be much higher. However, one source went into a bit more detail about these raters and stated, "'Currently, the ESRB uses a two-tiered system with six age-based ratings, complemented by 32 content descriptors that offer detailed information about a game, including the presence of everything from crude humor to tobacco references and animated blood. ESRB raters, the majority of whom have experience with children via education, profession, or parenthood, work for the board on a part-time basis. Now, let's take a deeper look at the ratings that these game raters are giving out. On the ESRB website, they list them as such. E for everyone means that the content is suitable for all ages, though it may contain minimal violence or mild language. E10 plus means, as the name suggests, everyone 10 and over. It's similar to E, just a bit more violence or language in it. T for teen may have gambling, blood, or crude humor. 
M for mature means the game is intended for those 17 or older. These games have more intense violent or gore, sexual content, and strong language. Adults only, 18 plus, may include gambling with real currency, prolonged scenes of intense violence, I think you get the idea. The higher the rating, the more violence, blood, and adult themes are present. There's also RP, of course, which simply means rating pending. E for everyone can be KA, kids to adults, and EC for early childhood. But it seems like those ratings were done away and they simply favor just doing E for everyone. I wonder what Dark Souls is classified as. Hold on, let me look that up really quick. Okay, so it looks like the ESRB classifies Dark Souls 3 as rated M for Mature 17 plus, And it says that it's an action role-playing game in which players assume the role of an undead character trying to rise through the ranks in the ancient land of Lothric. Hmm, okay. I don't know why I expected it to be maybe a T for teen or something, but yeah, that makes sense. Doesn't change my mind. I'm gonna get back to playing it again someday. I think I've taken a year and a half break from playing Dark Souls, so I'm feeling the itch again. Anyway. After these ESRB ratings were established in 1994, the ACC or Advertising Code of Conduct followed in 1995. A few years later in 2000, the ARC or Advertising Review Council was established as a division of the ESRB to monitor compliance with the new industry adopted marketing and advertising guidelines. ESRB even branched off creating ESRBI, trying to integrate their ratings into parental controls, though this failed in 2003. I don't want to say that for the first decade, nothing was happening, but they weren't particularly established or noteworthy yet. Plus video games, of course, weren't nearly as large and profitable as they are today. Any video game statistics will tell you that. Now, something of interest to note here is that the ESRB is not federally mandated and publishers technically aren't required to utilize it. But because most retailers won't carry games without a rating, the ESRB has kind of become an industry standard. Indie companies can forego the process, especially if they're publishing their game on a digital platform like Steam that doesn't require companies to carry an ESRB rating for their games. After all, the fees can run upwards of $10,000, so it's not exactly worth it for places that have a smaller budget. Now, before I get into the controversies and the issues that many people have with the ESRB, I wanted to get into how these games are rated just a bit more. Initially, I was all ready to dive in at the first sign of trouble, but I stumbled across a documentary from Noclip that I found really interesting and I wanted to share with you. The ESRB doesn't allow cameras or the media into their organization, but last year, in honor of their 25th anniversary, they extended an invitation to Noclip, who interviewed those that work there to answer the question, how does the ESRB rate their video games? Rather than get my information from just any online source, I thought it would be even better to get these specific answers straight from their mouth. Patricia Vance, or Pat, as she goes by in the documentary, the president of ESRB, explains that before ESRB, there were no consistent standards. We were the first rating system to have both age rating categories and content descriptors. Because our research at the time indicated that parents really wanted to have both. I'll absolutely give ESRB credit for that. I mean, I think if I were a parent, I might have a different opinion about cartoon violence as opposed to gambling themes. I'm not a mom, unless you count Casper, but he doesn't really play video games. But I can agree that it's important to know why a game has the rating it does. Some parents might be okay with violent content, but not sexual content and vice versa. In the next portion of this video, Pat clarifies the relationship between the ESRB and the ESA, the Entertainment Software Association, since those two are often confused. The ESA lobbies the government on behalf of major publishers and runs E3, the Electronic Entertainment Expo. Pat states, technically we are part of the ESA. We operate independently. We have a completely different mission. They're very member driven. We are taking industry adopted guidelines and enforcing them. And we're really the face of the industry for informing parents and making sure that we're acting in a responsible way. And it's just a very different sort of mission, but our board of directors is the same as the board that runs the ESA. They put their good citizen hats on with me. It works because they've bought into it. They believe that as an industry, self-regulation is the best approach. My attitude on self-regulation is the proof is in the pudding. We've been around for 25 years. Parents trust us, they use us. What more can we prove to do that we care about what we do and we're good at it? Noclip says that in order to establish if the ESRB are actually good at what they do, three questions have to be answered. The first is to see how games are rated at all. The second is exploring how the ESRB enforces advertising standards. The third is to see if they've adapted with the times and grown just as the gaming industry has. As for the first aspect, rating a game, it's no small or easy task. 
After all, a movie can be seen in a couple hours, but a video game can have hundreds of hours of gameplay, so there's far more steps in the process. As a fun side note here, the ESRB states that back in the day, they were on VHS types for far too long. They say up till 2008. They even had an occasional case where they'd be reviewing video of a gameplay and then an episode of Seinfeld would kick on because people were just taping over their old videos. A bitch is funny, I'm being funny. They're all digital now, but I kind of thought that was just a little funny. It's funny. <laughs> Of those three questions, the third one seems the most pressing to me. Is the ESRB growing with the times? The thing is the ESRB struggles to do this because they're so small and the gaming industry is so massive. With more indie developers that have little resources, Pat explains that she felt it was really important to try and create a scalable solution. She wanted to create an automatic rating system, the IARC or International Age Rating Coalition. Though the team at ESRB was adamantly against this at first, they admit that while the traditional way of doing things is great, it's simply not scalable. They first tested IARC with console games in the US before eventually speaking with different rating systems across the world and asking if they would consider a rating system like this. The ESRB explained that they weren't trying to export a US standard out there since different cultures have different standards and they adapted the IARC to suit a particular rating system's needs. Pat explains that this way a questionnaire only needed to be filled out once, but a developer could get a rating in every region and they wouldn't have to pay for it as opposed to paying a fee and submit for every single rating. However, though the ESRB seems to be adapting their rating system, there's one well-known instance where they were unable to anticipate change and react quickly enough. Noclip explains that limited run games attempted to release limited box copies of small indie titles. These were digital games without a physical copy, think like Steam, how we mentioned earlier, so they hadn't been through a ratings process. The cost was required to get a rating for all these games and it would have been so high that it didn't make business sense to do the limited edition physical versions. The ESRB was criticized heavily at the time for not having a mechanism in place for these smaller teams. Rocco and Bill from the ESRB said they've built a new process around cases like this, which means that these games will still have to go through the physical process, but it leverages the digital rating and it's cheaper than what the standard office is. And they said that if you have a valid digital ESRB rating for 90 days, then you're eligible. And that's how most limited runs happen. They're generally smaller teams that aren't familiar with the process and may need most handholding. Pat also addressed the topic of loot boxes and said that when the ESRB did research, it turned out that most parents didn't even know what a loot box was. Once it was explained to them, their biggest concern by far was spending. However, because it doesn't technically fit the requirements of gambling, they can't call it that. There is regulation though, as the industry in the US is tackling drop rates, but the ESRB's priority, Pat explains, is providing information to parents to continually evaluate the industry, talk to parents and evolve with the industry. The thing is, I'm really glad for this documentary because it changed my mind a lot about how I initially viewed the ESRB. By the time I finished it, I knew that I wouldn't be talking about a horrible review system that's broken beyond belief and needs to be overhauled the way I felt with the MPAA. Instead, the ESRB is a rating system that makes mistakes. And some of these mistakes, at least with the limited edition releases are in part because they can't predict the future and it's difficult to adapt to such a gigantic ever-changing industry. I'd say ESRB is an okay, decent company that has made mistakes and will probably continue to do so in the fast paced video game industry. Anyway, I do wanna get into the mistakes that the ESRB has made and address some of those accusations. But honestly, if you're curious about what the ESRB does, I highly, highly recommend No Clips documentary. It's on YouTube and it will always be linked in my sources. Now, before we dig into some of the ESRB's controversies, let's just take a quick break to thank today's sponsors. So isn't it just the greatest thing in the world when someone brings you a piece of clothing and it's actually something you wanted, needed, or actually think you'll enjoy wearing? Well, Stitch Fix Freestyle is a shop that is built just for you. It doesn't matter if you're looking for brands you already love or hoping to discover a new favorite. Stitch Fix Freestyle lets you shop a range of over 1,000 brands personalized to your size and fit. Stitch Fix Freestyle is here to be 
your trusted style destination where you can discover and instantly buy items curated for your style, likes, and lifestyle. You guys know the deal, I'm addicted to sweaters, always was, always will be, and they are my number one sweater shop. Plus, what's cool about Stitch Fix is it doesn't require a subscription and they always provide free shipping, returns, and exchanges. So if you wanna get started today and see what Stitch Fix has in store for you, make sure to fill out your style quiz at stitchfix.com slash casket. At stitchfix.com slash casket to try Stitch Fix Freestyle. Stitchfix.com slash casket. Carrying a balance on a high interest credit card every month can be super, super stressful. But Upstart is the fast, easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan and you can do it all online. Rather than looking at credit scores alone, Upstart also considers other factors like your income, current employment, and your overall credit history. To find a smarter rate for you, you can always check your rate online in just a couple minutes without it even affecting your credit score for loans between $1,000 and $50,000. It doesn't matter if you have a vacation plan that's coming up, if you're trying to consolidate some debts to make one easy payment, or maybe you just have a big expense that's coming along the way, Upstart is there to help. So if you wanna find out how Upstart can help you lower your monthly payments, make sure you go to upstart.com slash casket. That's upstart.com slash casket. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Again, make sure you go to upstart.com slash casket. All right, so let's get on to the first and one of the largest debates around the ESRB, and it has to do with GTA. And this also has to do with M and AO ratings. According to one source, if a publisher does not agree with a game's initial ESRB rating, they can edit the game's content and perform a submission process again. They can also appeal the rating, though this has largely gone unused. If the ESRB finds that a game misrepresented its age and content rating after release, such as not indicating the true level of violence, the publisher may be fined and the game may be assigned the proper rating, potentially leading to its recall. Notable examples of rating changes for games include The Punisher and Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. The publisher initially received an AO adults only rating for its extremely high level of violence. The developers edited the scenes and resubmitted the game, giving a lesser M mature rating. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas was initially given an M rating. However, a sexually explicit mini game called Hot Coffee was hidden in the game's code and a modification released to the public allowed players to access it. Subsequently, the ESRB changed the game's rating to AO, causing notable controversy and multiple lawsuits. Most major US retailers pulled the game from store shelves and government officials attempted to intervene by enforcing the ESRB as a federal mandate. Rockstar Games, the game's publisher, settled many class action lawsuits for various sums over the controversy. Later versions of the game prevented all access to hot coffee and the ESRB changed its rating back to M. This mod pushed their rating over the edge and it wasn't included in the game's submission or their M rating. The ESRB stated in the documentary that they've never had anyone maliciously hide content from them, so I can't say if this was purposeful or not, but it was certainly negligent and warranted the ESRB sanctioning Rockstar Games. I'm not saying Rockstar shouldn't have included a mini game that allowed a character to have sex, but if you're submitting a game for a rating, that type of thing should probably be included, even if it's just a mini game. Even the FTC got involved and they later explained that GTA had over $20 million in costs associated with the re-rating, so this didn't come cheap either. The thing is, the ESRB has been proven to work most of the time. I'm not saying examples like these don't exist, but they're definitely minimal. I'm not going to sit here and debate with anyone if Grand Theft Auto should be M or AO, but Rockstar Games hid their content from the ESRB, so I kind of feel like if you know anyone should be getting criticism, it's them. If these raiders had to go through every second of gameplay, hundreds and hundreds of hours worth, then I think the system would be truly broken, bogged down, and even more stretched than it already is. It's on the developer to explain their game and submit footage. But again, that's totally my opinion. Feel free to take it or leave it. The National Institute on Media and the Family has also criticized the ESRB for not using the AO rating enough and don't trust the industry to police itself, citing vested interest. But as Arts Technica puts it, the argument is lacking because of hidden assumptions. The flaw with this, of course, is that the industry isn't forcing anyone to buy the games. Whatever the ratings are, people are buying them up. It's the same thing we see in TV land. So many shows are horrible, despicable, affronts to decency. Which, by the way, millions and millions of people happen to watch. If parents cared about the ratings as much as the NIMF says that they do, and if they disagree with them as much as they claim they do, then the gaming industry wouldn't be seeing the successes that they do. 
Of course, this isn't to say that there aren't problems with the rating system. From any given perspective, there will be disagreements. And even if the ESRB admits this, but look at NIMF's appeal to M-rated games. They are getting more and more violent and more and more sexual. Alarming, no? But wait, M games are rated mature 17 plus. These aren't games for 12 year olds and if parents buy them for 12 year olds, it's their choice and problem. Is it really that shocking that games for 17 year olds could be violent and or sexual? I think the reality here though is that if a parent wants to buy that game for their child, fine. But it seems a bit ridiculous to me that parents would complain about the AO rating being underused and then let their 12 year old play Grand Theft Auto. There have been stores where teenagers under 17 with no parent present were able to buy M rated games, but the percentages are actually some of the lowest in the entertainment industry. One source stated that back in 2011, the worst offender in selling video games rated mature to children was Walmart, but only 20% of the secret shoppers were able to successfully buy M rated games at the big box retailer. The best retailer for ratings compliance in video games was Target with only 8% of children able to buy M rated titles. We are extremely pleased to see the Federal Trade Commission confirm not only that the video game industry continues to have the highest rate of enforcement at retail, but continues to climb higher than before. ESRB president Pratirsha Vance said in a response to the data, the strong support that the ESRB ratings have employed from retailers is crucial, underscoring their firm commitment to selling video games responsibly. Now, as for those loot boxes, ESRB stated in the documentary that they can't call it gambling, but they did come out with a statement in April, 2020, that they will have another descriptor on their ratings that says in-game purchases includes random items for games with loot boxes or items that are purchased with real world currency. This can also apply to item packs and mystery awards and the in-game purchases, including random items label, will apply to any game that includes purchases with any kind of randomized element. Now, it's one thing to pay for a better weapon or something in game, but when it comes to loot boxes, prize wheels, and paying for something unknown, I agree that this seems like the best direction to go in. If it can't be called gambling, fine, but at least a little warning like this does seem warranted. However, there have also been those that have some serious criticisms of the ESRB as well. One article from Medium called E for Ignored features a small video from a creator extra credit called Video Game Rating System. They said the first step is to have a content checklist, which well, ESRB already does. Then they said all developers need to agree on this universal checklist. They write their own games, but players can flag games that are misrepresented. The thing is, there's a couple reasons why I think this, frankly, is a terrible idea. The developers already do agree on a universal checklist, the one that's been determined by the ESRB. The only difference is that this video game implies players can flag games that are misrated. But what if a game is purposefully misrated? What if a developer labels their game as E for everyone, but it's pornographic? Why should the burden be on a kid who watched that then flag it and report it? The video even states two and a half minutes in that the ESRB could be responsible for going through these flags instead and seeing if enough people complained about the rating. And they say that if a game misrepresents itself, it could be suspended from the system for 30 days, which is incentive not to do it. But again, the ESRB does this by threatening fines up to a million dollars if a company lies about the content in their game. All this extra credit system does is put a lot more burden onto whoever actually has to go through these red flags. So I'm sorry, but I'm gonna be honest that it sounds like a complete and utter dumpster fire if we went forward with that. I understand that the ESRB costs and fees can be prohibitive to smaller studios, but why not have it just federally mandated then? I think in an indie developer that they would be better off releasing the game online, waiting the 90 days, and then paying for a cheaper service that the ESRB offers. Hopefully you understand where I'm coming from. I just figured it's more common sense that a game should be rated upon release or unrated with a content warning on Steam, as opposed to a rating chosen by a developer and then the burden of flagging falls upon the consumer who may be biased one way or another. Other sources have pointed to some sort of questionable ratings by the ESRB as well. For example, Donkey Kong 2 in 2005 got a T rating and this article states that it was a seemingly family-friendly game that got bumped up to a much more serious T rating because of mild lyrics. After originally earning a T rating, the ESRB bumped this release to an M because of a locked out art file, if accessed by using an apparently unauthorized third-party tool, allows the user to play the game with topless versions of female characters. The move instigated a debate about how the ESRB should handle the increasing number of games supporting mods and player-created content that's not part of the original release. 
These days, the ESRB tends to note that a game experience may change during online play in such games and leaves it to parents to worry about the content that might come from big bad internet. The thing is, I think it's ultimately up to developers to change their game once they receive feedback if they like. The ESRB tells them why it got that rating and at least that's what they claim to do. So I'm sure the developers that are, you know, all right with that higher rating can tell their audience why that happened. Other critiques of the ESRB are pretty similar to things we've already heard or a little bit vague. One states, according to the ESRB, they want their rating system shoved down your throat on their webpage, ESRB engages in aggressive public education and outreach efforts that promote the ESRB rating system, explain how it works and encourage parents to use it. Apparently parents can't make a decision themselves. It has to be based upon the ESRB rating system. A similar remark is written later. Helping consumers make informed purchase decisions at the point of sale is critical. And so ESRB works closely with retailers to help ensure that their stores display signage about the ESRB rating system, train their store associates about the ratings and enforce their store policies. Everyone needs to know that the ESRB is around because parents clearly can't make a decision themselves. It's like bad parenting and the ESRB are hand in hand. You clearly don't care enough about your child to research a game that you're going to buy for them. So rely on the ESRB's parents and take everything we say for granted. These are not informed purchases, but purchases where you take everything the ESRB has written down for granted because they want to shove their policies and beliefs down your throat. Hence the highly aggressive campaign they have instituted. If you really care about whether a game was appropriate for you or your child, you would do your own research for the game to make sure there wasn't something inappropriate for your child or your beliefs since everyone is different. And I would say surface level, this sounds okay, but I cringe hearing the do your own research because it just gives me hella anti-vax vibes. But just considering that the ESRB has been educating parents for a while now, and despite kids at times getting their hands on games that are perhaps a bit too mature for them, they're still one of the most well-regulated industries. So I'm not saying this entire criticism is not valid, but a lot of these issues seem to lie with the parents as well. The most ESRB can really do is educate and say, hey, these are the issues. They haven't said any encouraging or discouraging words about buying a product. So I can't really fault them for some of these controversies. So I guess the ESRB system has some issues as all systems do, but it actually seems like it might be doing its job. I am certain that there will be more controversies over the years and they will absolutely make more mistakes. However, all things considered, I don't seem to actually have that much of an issue with the ESRB at all. The MPAA is all kinds of problematic, but I don't think the ESRB really is that bad. I do think that the fees to get your game rated is real difficult and it's it's really expensive, especially for indie developers and they don't make it incredibly available and they're kind of closed off about it. And that I think kind of sucks because it really hurts those indie people. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode. I know this one was a little bit shorter, but I still hope you enjoyed it all the same. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so you can stay up to date on all the latest content. Thank you for spending some of your time here with me today. I appreciate it. And I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Bye.